from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. I'm Tyne Morgan, and here's what's in store over the next 60 minutes. The stock and commodity markets bleeding red this week. We have a virus in the United States around the world that is expanding that is new to the world. And the market is a little bit of a panic right now. Matt says coronavirus was the catalyst for the big drop. But is the market fear justified? I don't think we've seen the bottom quite yet. That's as logistics for moving ag goods could soon cause chaos. From market fallout to a change to buy cheaper inputs. We've got relief in progress, and I do expect us to head lower from here. And in John's world? Don't panic. Well, maybe a little. Now for the news, this really taking center stage, a wild ride for the markets, all because of coronavirus as fear and uncertainty continues to haunt investors. Countries shifting to damage control for their economies as infections spread, Britain taking dramatic steps to cushion the economic shock of the outbreak, announcing a $39 billion package of measures to keep people and businesses afloat. The Bank of England slashing its key interest rate. That follows similar moves by central banks in the U.S. and Canada. Governments around Asia and elsewhere announcing billions of dollars in stimulus funds. But activity is not expected to return to normal until at least mid-April. And the National Pork Producers Council is warning of serious disruption to the U.S. pork industry since there are already shortages at hog farms and in processing plants. Their concern, it could be made worse by the virus. The organization calling for more guest worker visas. Trading of commodities also impacted with the CME group saying the Chicago trading floor would close after business hours Friday in response to the virus. Well, more talk this week about the future of the biofuel waiver programs and some fear that an announcement soon could be a blow to biofuels. Reuters reporting the Trump administration wants an additional two weeks to respond to a recent court decision about those waivers. There were also reports the administration would appeal the decision. Earlier this year, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit ruled exemptions granted to three refineries actually overstepped the EPA's authority because those refiners had not previously been granted waivers. Renewable fuels groups have fought against the waivers, which they say cut down on demand for their fuels, such as ethanol. Well, some in the market waiting for possible changes on supply and demand from USDA, but the report this week really showed little change. USDA making no major changes for domestic corn, soybeans, and wheat supplies, and China still really not a factor in this report, except when it comes to sorghum, with China's imports raised reflecting some recent buys from the U.S. USDA added 15 million bushels to the sorghum export estimate, took it up to 135 million bushels, now, they partially offset by that by taking 10 million bushels out of the sorghum feed and residual usage estimate, but we still got a 5 million bushel reduction in sorghum carryover. So when we're talking about a 35 million bushel uh, carryover and you take, or a 40 million bushel carryover, you take 5 million out of that to get us down to 35 million bushels, that's a significant move for sorghum carryover. Makes me wonder what we've got left for exportable supplies of sorghum. Flory says if sorghum supplies do in fact start to run short, it could push China to start importing other grains like corn and DDGs to fill their feed needs. Well, numerous closings and cancellations this week due to coronavirus. One of those, a pinnacle livestock show in Houston. Show attendees given short notice to leave as the doors were closing at 4 p.m. that day. That's after officials believed someone with coronavirus attended the event weeks ago. One of those heading to the show this week was a high school senior from Sunray, Texas. He's been showing for a decade, and this would have been his last time to attend the Houston Livestock Show. This has been my last year to show, and at the past two stock shows that I've been to, we have not done so well. And we were really thinking we were going to do pretty good at the Houston stock show. Now, Crown River says it's not just about those showing being impacted. The winner receives half the money, but the other half of that money goes to scholarships for inner city kids. Well, it was another wet week for many of our viewers. Will that continue next week? We'll have a check of weather with meteorologist Mike Hoffman. That's next.
Set yourself up for success by getting an early season win against weeds. Use Corvus with multiple sites of action for enhanced burn down of weeds plus reactivation for end of season rewards. Time now for a check of weather with meteorologist Mike Hoffman. Mike, I was in Kansas and Missouri this week. Those farmers seen rain. There was a deluge of rain in Southern California. It was an active weather week for many. Yeah, that's right, Tyne, and really the overall pattern looks like that will continue. Uh, now we continue to see wet areas through the middle of the country, as you can see, although if you really take a look at the Central Plains, this root zone is from earlier this past week. It has dried out compared to uh, three or four weeks ago, a little bit, but we are still very wet parts of the Tennessee Valley down into Mississippi and Alabama and very wet from the Great Lakes all the way back into northeastern Wyoming and southeastern Montana. Uh, dry conditions and overall from central Colorado back through the western states. This has gotten drier and drier in central California. Now the good news is we do have moisture coming in uh, to those areas and you had some moisture this past week as well. So hopefully we'll begin to see some improvement in that over time. As far as the drought monitor is concerned, it continues to expand in California like we've been talking. The Four Corner region continues to be fairly dry. Much of Texas has improved except the southern sections and they've gotten actually drier as you can see. Now let's take a look at the jet stream. Interesting pattern cut off off the west coast. Now that always pumps in the moisture to uh, the southwest especially and some of that comes into the plain states. You can see as we head through time a trough digs into the Great Lakes trying to bring in some colder air but really most of that uh, the really cold stuff stays north of the Canadian border. Still a cut off by the middle of the week into the southwest. That kind of remains, part of that energy comes uh, northeast, part of it remains off the west coast with a shot of cold air just to the northeast of uh, New England, <clears throat> as you can see as we head into next weekend. So still an interesting weather pattern. I mean, when you see the jet stream like this, it's bringing a lot of Pacific moisture into the pattern, more than usual. And of course, every system will bring in some golf moisture as well. So you, it can be fairly wet wherever these storm systems move in the eastern two-thirds of the country as they come out of the southwestern portions of the United States. Here's uh, the way the maps look as we uh, look at Monday stationary front from the southeast back into Texas and Oklahoma. Just some scattered showers and thunder showers. Chilly weather but dry weather. Great Lakes in the northeast. Storm system coming in out west. That's with that cutoff. You can see rain and mountain snows. By Wednesday then, uh, one piece starts to come out into the plains, another piece still hanging out in the uh, southwest, a little bit of a cold front coming into the northern uh, Rockies, and that uh, produces some active weather there for the western two-thirds of the country, still dry in the east. By Friday then, it all comes together over a huge wet system over the eastern part of the country, and you can see golf moisture coming up into this pattern as well. So snow on the western sections of that storm system, rain and thunderstorms farther east. Here's my forecast for the next 30 days from the mid-Atlantic, Pennsylvania, New York included, all the way into Texas, above normal temperatures, below normal in the northwest, above normal moisture from the Gulf Coast into the lower lakes, and also in the southwestern portions of the country. Tyne. Thanks, Mike. Well, fear over coronavirus was injected into the markets this week, but is that fear justified? And what could be next? Jim McCormick and Brian Roach join me for a marketing discussion in the studio. That's next. Well, welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. So much already on the show about coronavirus, and that's really what we're going to talk about in this first roundtable. I mean, so much fear, so much uncertainty in the market right now. Is that concern justified? Yes, I believe so right now. I mean, the fact of the matter is we have a virus in the United States around the world that is expanding that is new to the world. And the market is a little bit of a panic right now. This is what happens in the long run, though, Tyne. We've got to play it out. China took around 25, 30 days to max out before it kind of started leveling out. We're in the beginning stages here in the United States. I fear it's going to get worse in the next couple of weeks, but then we will calm down eventually. Okay, that was my next question. I mean, Brian, do you think we found the bottom of these markets, or is there still cause for these markets to continue to trend lower? Oh, I, I don't. I don't think we've seen the bottom quite yet. Uh, the equity markets are, you know, locking up 
uh, twice this morning um, on on uh, seven percent, and then you know now we're running at a fourteen percent limit on the equity market. So um, the equities and financials are kind of one thing, but but the uh, typically the crop markets trend lower anyway into April May. Right. Um, and so I think we're accelerating that probably, if anything. But I do agree with Jim. I mean, we're we're uh, the U.S. is behind the eight ball in terms of containment. So we're going to run a kind of a behind the behind the eight ball containment uh, process as opposed to being ahead of it. And I think that the the differential is that it spreads far faster and to far more people, although not deadly. Um, it still does f transfer very e efficiently, but also to a broader audience quicker. Uh -huh. You know, and I've heard the argument from farmers this week that, you know, why is there so much concern? Why is there so much fear? Because people at the end of the day, they have to eat. So so why is this impacting the commodity market so hard right now? Well, right now, the commodity market is just getting drugged down by by the, by the stock market at this point in time. But, you know, part of the reason why there is a concern out there is the reality is, think about this, I hate to equate it to the flu because it's not the flu, but think about it. What part, any, any of the producers out there did not get see somebody they know got the flu this year right. or every year? Everyone's going to deal with this eventually. The problem the commodity market's got right now is logistics of what are you going to do with it. Consumption's going to drop in your term. Like in the beef market, as people are not spending, then the real logistic fear, fear comes happens. Is this really becomes a problem? Is how do you move product from A to B? How do you get that beef from the packer to the grocery store? Will that trucker be willing to take that? So that is why the market's just very concerned about that demand at the moment. Now that demand is inelastic. In the long run, it will come back. But right now, the fear of the unknown has just got people running to the sidelines. I believe. Yeah, so Brian, when you look at the logistics of it, and maybe a truck driver doesn't want to go into the city or doesn't want to go from point A to point B to point C, is it beef market? Is it grain market? I mean, logistics, what commodity do you think it will impact the most? Well, I think the, the, the meat, certainly the meat industry is going to see the biggest disruptions. Uh, the grain, you know, ports could close without port workers and, you know, without river uh, uh, cargoes being loaded, etc. So I think there'll be disruptions, but not certainly a halt to all of it. Um, I think we're probably 20, 30 days from seeing the peak anyways. And, um, and so between now and then, there's a huge unknown, school closures, et cetera. And I think that we're just getting started on that. And Jim, I don't even think if we, if we do deal this with, with this for 20 days, 30 days, even longer than that, a lot of our viewers already frustrated at commodity prices now. What if it does only get worse? Well, it's, you know, the fact of the matter is you got to be realistic right now. It probably is, unfortunately, folks out there, it's probably going to get worse right now. When the market is in free fall and no one knows what to do, it tends to be sell first, ask questions later. But the reality is we are dealing with an inelastic product. The other thing is if you didn't panic, think about the 08 financial crisis. When the market broke hard in 08, people who did not panic made a lot of money in the long run. It did come back. Crude oil gets down into the 20s. It's very cheap historically. Diesel gets down below a dollar. Heating oil, that is the time where producers, instead of panicking, may say, look, or end users, I need to lock in one, two, three years worth of, de of demand for my product. And when this market comes back up, it will snap back. The world economies, not just the Fed, but all the banks are going to do everything they can to stimulate this when it's back done, and that probably will be inflationary in the long run. All right. Well, Brian, I mean, we had crude to begin the week. We had coronavirus that continued to infect the markets this week. What was the catalyst that really drove the markets with so much red? Well, the, the Chinese situation had been contained, but as, as the, as the uh, situation in Italy and Europe started to uh, escalate, certainly the, the folks around the world, non-China, had to start paying, paying a lot of attention. So today we're liquidating assets. You know, the stock market has margin calls, gold's not safe, nothing's really safe, and so you're seeing a, a kind of a rush to liquidity to cover some of these ex exposures in the financial market. But I think that the Fed will pump a lot of, they will be injecting a lot of liquidity into the market, and at some point when the financial markets, not so economic, but financial markets see a green light, mm -hmm. we'll see a sharp response. I don't think that's a V. It's probably a U that feels like an L. But the reality is, uh, is that the financial markets will respond to it when the green light comes on. I don't know exactly when that will happen. Well, a lot of questions about demand right now, especially when it comes from China and, and, and actually the administration acknowledging that China may not fulfill its promise. We've heard some of that, but what impact could that continue to have on the markets? We'll talk about that when we come back later on U.S. Farm Report.
Well, we've really been talking about coronavirus the entire show, from the news and the headlines to talking about the impact on the market. There's a lot of fear, but is panic justified? Here's John Phipps. Perhaps no phrase has been more overworked than don't panic over the last few days. I find that singularly unhelpful for several reasons. First, not to trivialize, but most people are not panicking in the medical sense of the word. Those who suffer from true panic disorder could educate us on how this, on this crippling mental state is absolutely disabling and physically hazardous. The emotions most worriers are experiencing pales in comparison even to anxiety attacks. What the majority of us are living through should sober us up to better understand those who truly live with panic in their lives. Second, these pseudo-panic feelings are natural, predictable, and part of our self-defense instinct. They should be respected, as psychologists have revealed what seems like mystic intuition can be our minds working in the background under stress to find patterns that indicate a danger. By the time our rational brains has fleshed out this suspicion into a plausible threat, the most effective time to act may have passed. So my personal advice, for all it's worth, is respect the early messages from your emotions, panic early, so to speak, and make a rapid token response. I sold some grain last week based on little more than an uncomfortable feeling about world events. Right or wrong, it helped my outlook. Third, this pseudo-panic occurs when our brain at some level realizes incoming evidence presents an event way beyond our plans. The idea that farmers should have had a plan for a pandemic is preposterous, but we should know what prices are economically disastrous. Don't panic is too often translated into do nothing. While inaction may be the optimal response, only you can decide if that fits your goals and ability. I find taking small actions in what I think is the right direction prevents feeling powerless and keeps my rational brain in the game. It also generates valuable data for future decisions. Finally, cut yourself some slack. If your decision making during crises is even 50% successful, you're a big winner. There is no trophy for looking totally cool during a time like this, unless it's an Oscar because we're all faking it. Bottom line, don't waste time pretending you're not panicking on some level. Recognize what is really happening with your neurochemistry and appreciate how your natural defenses are working for you. Go ahead and panic a little, and then use that energy to defend your future. Thanks, John. And by the way, he wanted me to mention, he actually recorded that segment on Monday when really all of the panic and the fear was, was heightened. All right, when we come back, an antique tractor from the Show Me State. Greg Peterson has Tractor Tales next. Tractor Tales is brought to you by eTractor.com, Sullivan Auctioneer's new online equipment platform, eTractor.com. Welcome back to Tractor Tales, folks. This week we're headed to northern Missouri and we're going to share with you a 1930 United. Alice Chalmers started building this tractor in uh, 1929. According to the serial number, this is, was the first one built in 1930, the second year. The United Company was formed by several little companies that got together and they decided they seen a good market for a utility tractor still. So they went to Alice Chalmers to ask them if they'd build it and Alice Chalmers did with the agreement that, that they would also be able to build one with their name on it. So this is the United, has the United name on the front. The Alice Chalmers tractor that they built had Alice Chalmers across the front. I've got enough parts to build at least one of the Alice Chalmers tractors down the road, so hopefully one of these days I'll be able to have a pair of them to show. A friend of mine located it out in uh, eastern Colorado. He called me one day and said, I found a tractor I think you might be interested in. When I uh, restored this tractor, the fan belt was in bad shape. I got to talking to a friend of mine up in uh, Iowa, told him I was going to have to buy one of these reproduction fan belts, and I thought, you know, I'd rather have something that looks a little better than 
than those. And he says, well, go home and check your book, see what that part number is. I bought out an old Alice Chalmers dealership, and I think I may have a new old stock fan belt hanging on the wall. So I called him, told him what the number was. Sure enough, he had it. And so I've got that new fan belt on here, and it has Alice Chalmers in orange letters down the side of the, the uh, fan belt. And then another item I think is kind of unique. This is the way the oil pressure gauge originally was screwed on down here at the block. And the farmer that used this tractor put this pipe on here to get it up closer to the hole in the dash where he could see it easier. And I thought, that looks pretty good. So I, I'm just going to leave it just the way he did it there. Thanks so much. Well, as oil prices fell this week, is it an opportunity to capture cheaper diesel prices? What about farm inputs? We'll try to find the silver lining in all of this. That's next when we come back with our Farm Journal Report. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report, trusted, timely tradition. Welcome back. Well, commodity prices seem to be in a free fall this week. And while commodity prices look to keep dropping, so does the price of some major farm inputs, which means it may carve out an opportunity to buy. That's this week's Farm Journal report. The market's off to a messy start on Monday. Everything from the stock market to commodity markets feeling the impact of a double whammy, the spread of coronavirus and a battle over oil. This all comes from an oil production war, which uh, Saudi Arabia had, had wanted Russia to, to join in. And they said, look, we've been, we've been on curtailed production for three years now. We're done with that. The Saudis said, you know what, we're going to go the other way and we're going to increase production. We're going to lower our price targets. And that was something that was totally unexpected. The market is going to be flooded with oil, at least in the short term. Vaklovic says crude oil is the king of commodity markets. And so the price drop started to drag other commodity markets with it. When it makes these big moves and it loses 25, 30% in a day, you're going to see these other markets react. Now, is that something that you're going to have to see play out if crude stays cheap for three or four months? No, I, I think ultimately you'd see the corn market, the soybean market, the wheat market separate itself from that. But I just think the knee jerk reaction here is just crews down 25% a day. We've got to sell everything. And that's kind of what we saw at least early on Monday. But it wasn't just the oil war cutting into the markets this week. Coronavirus continuing to infect markets across the board. This is very dynamic. It's fairly unprecedented. The sell off has almost been kind of orderly uh, there. Like on Monday, we saw big, big declines in the stock market but there wasn't a tremendous amount of volatility compared to what maybe we could see. So I think that, I think the coronavirus was a catalyst for the big correction in the stock market, which a lot of people would argue was overdue to begin with. And there's always a catalyst for, for a sell off or for a correction. The catalyst for a major correction in the stock markets in the midst of so much uncertainty surrounding the spreading virus. What I know for sure is that the coronavirus has been without a doubt the catalyst at least for this correction in, in the stock market, which has been in a, a 10 plus year bull market. I mean, we were due for something substantial here and now we've got it. A cut to commodity markets is bad news for farmers hoping for higher prices, but good news for buyers looking for cheaper inputs. And we've got relief in progress and I do expect us to head lower from here. That's as heating oil futures fall and cheaper retail diesel prices could also be on the way. There's a lag there. So when you see a big move in heating oil futures, uh, about Oh, anywhere from a week to three weeks out, you'll begin to see that impact the farm diesel market. A price cut on the futures market happening this week means the bottom of retail diesel prices may be yet to come. I think there's room to the downside in that on farm retail diesel price. I think now is not the correct time to book um, because the, the lag that I've noticed in my analysis between the heating oil futures and the retail price is anywhere from 7 to 22 days. And so we won't see this um, price move in the futures actually impact your at the farm gate price for at least another week, probably two to three weeks. 
It's not just diesel that could be less expensive. Other farm inputs may see softer prices due to coronavirus. My survey shows anhydrous ammonia off $100 from the same week last year. A uh, pretty similar by percentage on the UAN solutions as well. Prices that could continue to trend lower. China are a large importer of ammonia for industrial purposes. If they have an economic slowdown, this is going to be deleterious to um, industrial products and deleterious to demand. China uses a tremendous amount of ammonia um, for manufacturing purposes, not just for fertilizers. If they're refusing those deliveries, now we've got a, a system flush with ammonia. That's going to drive down your anhydrous price. My subscribers are 50% booked for their spring and summer needs. I'm very comfortable there. But not all inputs could flood the market. A potential shortage on some products may be brewing. A lot of the, uh, the compounds, the, the chemicals that farmers use on their farms, uh, they're put together maybe in, in this country, but the small molecules, the ingredients, a lot of those come from China. And though that there's a, starting to be a bit of a disruption in some of that, that supply chain. And so if you can't get the ingredients to put together to make your chemical, we're going to have a problem. At the top of that list, phosphates. And that's a concern because so much of, of the phosphate that's out on the export market is made, manufactured in the Hubei province of China. One hiccup that could cause a major ripple effect. If you look at Hubei province, that accounts for about 14.7 million metric tons of phosphate, finished phosphate production. If they're running at about 60% of their plants are out of production at the moment and the rest 40 plus percent are running in a various state of up to full capacity or down to full capacity. You have a significant impact on that supply. A supply issue Michelson is also closely watching. So as they may have difficulties not only manufacturing enough product to keep up with demand, but also getting it shipped out, moved to ports and out on, on the open sea, we're going to see a price response there. Well, it's possibly a buying opportunity for some farm inputs, but are cheaper commodity prices also a buying opportunity for China? A roundtable discussion picks back up next. Back now with our marketing roundtable, talked a lot about coronavirus, but now let's look at China. Secretary Purdue acknowledging this week that China may not be able to fulfill its its promise because of coronavirus. We saw China cancel some pork shipments this week. I mean, what do you think we what what could the fallout continue to be when we look just at Chinese demand, Jim? Well, right now I think the fallout's going to be short term. I think the pork cutout had to do with the fact just there was a massive logistics problem of getting all this beef and pork that's sitting in the ports unloaded. So as you can't unload it, why bring more on? So I think that's why we saw the cancellation this week in the pork. But in the long run, they've got to feed their people. The price of pigs have gone through the roof. Um, over $300 for a piglet we're hearing. Um, their meal, or excuse me, their crush demand is back to pre-coronavirus level. So the demand will come back in. The problem we're dealing with right this moment, though, is we're competing with South America. Their currency continues to weaken. Right. They've got a big crop. That's going to keep us on the back burner, but I do anticipate China to try to make a good faith effort as we get closer maybe to late summer, our harvest. Brian, and we, we did see some other sales this week, some sales of soybeans, some flash sales of corn. It, but, but is that just new crop at this point? Uh, no, no. We also saw cancellations in beans this morning, too. I mean, so uh, it's not just the pork that was canceled. Uh, big, big week for corn, 1.4 million uh, tons. That's a good week. The issue with corn right now, um, China really is not interested in U.S. corn. They're interested, though, in Milo. And they, you know, we're hearing 12, 15 cargoes of Milo. So that, that will continue to be, it looks to me like that's in play. Um, but far as demand to the U.S., the U.S. export markets, we need corn to kind of stay above that million ton level. Okay, we need, and beans really, without a China buyer, uh, we're going to carry in more beans, at least into, say, the May WASTI report. Um, I think we put in lows similar to last year in that April, May time zone where specs take a huge net short. Last year, corn net specs were net short over 300 million, 300,000 contracts. I think beans will probably be in that same boat, and then we'll see how the U.S. weather season goes. This would be a normal pattern. We've seen this out of the last five years. Yeah. Four out of the last five years, we've taken a, a kind of a post-South American crop high uh -huh. down into some sort of a April-May low in the U.S., and then we trade U.S. weather. I don't see that changing this year. 
Yeah, I mean, when you look at some of these buys, Jim, I think a, a, a lot of farmers were hopeful when these buys started, then we could see the markets pop. But this week, it seems like that really, that, that's not what the market is focused on. They're, they're unimpressed right now. Is that just because there's so much going on with coronavirus? Is that trumping everything? The, I think the coronavirus is really trumping everything oh, right okay. now. The market is really just, it's in chaos at the moment. There's a little bit of fear right now. I can agree with Brian, though. I think we're going to see this market kind of trend lower, just like we did last year. Um, the supply out of South America will hold the beans down. The corn acreage, it looks like it's going to be high. If we're off to a decent planting, that's probably going to put pressure into the market. But just like Brian said, we'll see what the weather market gives us this summer. And then also just kind of see what happens with this coronavirus. Demand tends to trend back in chaos. But then one week kind of we'll see some demand snap back in. And you're going to see end users say this corn is undervalued. These beans potentially could be way undervalued mm -hmm. if we don't get all these bean acres in. So that could snap back into the summertime. Brian, coronavirus is trumping everything right now. We're getting ready for USDA to release planting intentions. Will the market shift its focus then to supply, shift it away from demand and into supply in the next couple weeks? Well, I think the, guy, the, the analyst expectation is 93 to 95 million acres of corn. Mm -hmm. The corn uh, bean ratio suggests that, that, that corn kind of wins over beans at this point. Uh, the interesting part will be stocks. And do we really have as much corn on hand as the USDA thinks? Uh, I could probably argue ba this, the, the basis values, spread values, um, suggest that the corn crop might be smaller. So we could see uh, some, some friendliness out of that end of month stocks report. That certainly would make the, the July contract run over the December contract. I think that's around minus a penny and a quarter today. So if that spread were to trade that idea that we do have smaller old crop corn, uh, inventory uh, that might be some positive that came at the end of the month but I don't know how you rule out a big acreage number against um, normalized yield. Do you think right now USDA is underestimating Chinese soybean demand? I think they get it pretty close on hand right now. I mean, okay. they've bumped it up a little bit right now, so uh -huh. I think they're in line. And one thing about the corn, I was going to, I agree with Brian on this corn stocks. I think it's going to be friendly, but the one thing we're finding is a lot of this corn is very poor quality corn. So we, we believe the stocks are probably not one nine time, they're probably closer to one six. But the thing is, we don't have one, yeah. 1.6 billion bushels of good corn. We only have maybe 1.1, 1.2. The rest is just trash corn, plain and simple, that's gonna be sitting in elevators and blended off of the new crop. So the, t the actual physical cash supply is gonna be tight. That hopefully will be bullish the July corn market. And like Brian said, the bull spread should work if that's the play. If that's the play. All right, well, a lot to watch in the next couple of weeks, a lot to digest from the markets this week. Thank you so much. Jim McCormick, Brian Roach, thank you for joining us this weekend. We appreciate it. Stay with us. We'll have much more on U.S. Farm Report when we come back. Well, conservation efforts are just a way of life for many, but for one Wisconsin farmer, her conservation mindset is garnering national attention and a national award. Here's Clinton Griffiths. And then we'll connect out of that back into the existing tile lines. It's not a surprise to see Nancy Cavazanjan and her husband Charles Hammer out working on a project. If we can reduce the phosphorus, we can show that we're not contributing to that problem anymore. They've been doing projects together for 40 years, no-tilling and being land conscious for 30 of those, adopting the motto, our soil, our strength. We wanted to say that we cared so much about our soil because it would give us healthy crops. Now all of a sudden, fast forward 40 years, it's soil sexy, right? The two own and operate Hammer and Cavazanjan Farms, a farm in Beaverdam, Wisconsin, that's been in the Hammer family for more than 150 years. Nancy, however, grew up in suburban Long Island, New York. Today, Nancy and her husband focus on protecting the farmland, creating the highest quality food feed and protecting the waters by it and caring for the community. Okay. They've committed to both wind. It offsets about 70% of the electrical needs of our farm. And solar energy. They're big on cover crops and were among the first to adopt no-till and strip-till in the area. The radishes help break up the soil better in here. They also scavenge the leftover nitrogen and hold it there all while also protecting pollinators. The first year or two, it was a mess. It looked awful. And thinking ahead for the next generation. Maybe it'll pay for their college education. We know that those black walnuts are worth a lot of money. 
Nancy is active with a county farmer-led watershed group, sharing with nearby non-farm and lakefront property owners. And tell them that ag is part of the solution. Uh, it's, we, have to, we have to do more of that. The idea is it's going to reduce and take out almost all of the, nit the, the phosphorus. phosphorus. They're working with the university to pilot and install a phosphorus reduction system for their existing drainage tiles. We're going to proof the phosphorus reduction first, then we're going to add the nitrate, we hope, the uh, biofilter next, and um, so you got to stay tuned for the results of that. <laughs> Nancy and Charles have a goal to do the impossible. I can remember my father-in-law standing there going, oh, that'll never work. And uh, it's worked. And we've been over 30 years of not plowing our soils. Really proud of that. Proud to be part of the ag industry today and in the future. But we can say we're part of the solution. Well, congratulations to the ASA Conservation Award winner. That award given out at Commodity Classic earlier this month. Well, from conservation to environmental efforts, John Phipps has customer support next. What's the status of wind energy? Well, wind energy seems to strike various chords among farmers, landowners, and our viewers. But is wind energy safe? Here's John Phipps. Patricia Temples from Stannardsville, Virginia, would like an update on wind turbines. While traveling a couple years ago, we noticed many fields of wind turbines in Kansas and other western states. In location where the lands was flat, we also noticed cows grazing under them. There's a lot of information on both sides of the issue of wind turbines. Just wondering what your take is on this form of renewable energy and its impact on farming. Great question. Thank you. Wind energy now has been around long enough to have sufficient data to reach some conclusions about these questions and also suggest its future. Okay, in 2019, wind energy generated 7%, a little bit more, of all U.S. electricity compared to 38 for natural gas and 23 for coal. Looking at how this has changed this century alone, here's a similar chart from 2000. Wind energy is growing at about 8% annually, and newer, more efficient turbines will accelerate that trend. Solar perhaps had the, has the greatest growth potential, however, and it's now cheaper to build new solar capacity that, uh, than operate old coal units. Some people do not like turbines. They tend to be a small number in areas where units are being built, and typically not on their ground. Numerous rigorous health studies have been conducted both here and in countries like Denmark with much longer wind energy history. There is no evidence of wind turbines constituting any health danger including cancer. And this of course applies to livestock as well. I respect the rights of neighbors or anyone to dislike turbines, but unfounded health issues and conspiracy theories don't seem to be affecting the growth curve for that source. There are issues farmers and other landowners should consider. Decommissioning costs and actions, for example, should be clearly spelled out in a contract. Also, the idea of an enormous cube of concrete buried in your field from now on should be part of your analysis. And, of course, the obvious need to farm around them. But the income seems to make that inconvenience more than worth it. The retirement of cold plants, the increasing ability of the grid to handle intermittent nature of wind energy, and the explosion in solar capacity and more power storage are rewriting how electricity is generated in our country. Wind power is a safe and economical part of that transition. Thanks, John, and send your questions to John at mailbag at usfarmreport.com. All right, it's been one year since the bomb cyclone hit, sparking historic flooding. So how does it look a year later? We'll show you that next. Weathering the storm, a special report focusing on Mother Nature's potential impact on the 2020 growing season is coming to Ag Day, U.S. Farm Report and AgriTalk later this month. Brought to you by Pivot BioProven, the nitrogen producing microbes that stay put, whether or not. Well, it's been one year 
since the bomb cyclone hit, which was really the catalyst for the massive flooding we saw in states like Nebraska, Iowa, Missouri, and Kansas. And a year later, while so much has changed, there's a lot that hasn't. A reminder of the devastation farmers still face. When the water got about 10 to 12 feet up on the side of the bend, it got water inside there in the grain. It caused the grain to swell and it just popped the bin wide open. This is the scene today, a scene that all started nearly a year ago when we first visited this farm last March. The Missouri River creating a total loss on this farm. And with grain bin full of priced grain, the water started rising too much too fast, leaving Green with no time to get his grain out. Not very much notice when it started. That wall of water came down and it just took right over. Green just started renting this farm and his first crop would have been in 2019 and now he may not get it planted this year either. This farm here probably not unfortunately which is going to hurt. Yeah, right. Nothing has gotten done to the levee. This Missouri farmer preparing to not farm some of this land again in 2020. It's a battle because so we've had an open winter, so we've been able to uh, get it onto the land, a lot of the land, and, and start the uh, process of recovery. Um, just within the last few days until this rain yesterday, we've been able to just start trying to conquer some of the battles we face with everything from flood debris to sand. It was still going to be a long battle, another year of battling sand um, to just levee repair. Well, as you just saw, the devastation really still staring at many farmers and landowners. But could they face a repeat of flooding in 2020? Join us next weekend for a special edition of U.S. Farm Report called Weathering the Storm. Not only will we reflect back on such a draining 2019 weather year, but piece together various forecasts to get a glimpse of how 2020 could pan out from a fight over flooding to a fight for water. That's next weekend for Weathering the Storm. Well, thank you so much for joining us this weekend on U.S. Farm Report. Be sure to join us next week as we work to build on our tradition. Have a great weekend, everyone. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.